it's nice to have familiar faces, I guess. They kind of have a sense of what kind of participation we might have. And, and uh, so that's good. You're welcome to come in, Tom. I'm calling you out on the microphone that you stuck your head in here, but you didn't stay. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. We can work on that. I'll forgive you later. <clears throat> well, this is a fun, fun topic, not necessarily because it is fun, but because it's so applicable and meaningful um, in, in our lives, this idea of forgiveness, right? Um, so some of you came for points, which is a valid reason to come. And uh, some of you might also have some thoughts about this idea of forgiveness, wanting to do a little bit better with that or have some more peace in your life. Um, and uh, hopefully we can give you a couple pointers or tips <coughs> to add to your already uh, personal experiences with, with this topic. So before we get too far into this, does anyone have um, some questions or kind of things they're looking to get out of today's presentation, out of this topic of forgiveness? You don't have to give me personal stories. I know that sometimes these questions are fairly personal, but any particular questions or concerns or you can ask hypothetical questions if you'd like. Okay. Well, if they come up, speak up, call out. Um, it doesn't hurt my feelings to have discussion. Uh, you don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to get any permission. Um, just uh, let's have some Let's have some good discussion that way. I'm curious about the question mark. Yes. It's there on purpose. Okay. It's not a typo. The question mark, forgive and forget. We hear that a lot, that phrase, right? You got to forgive and forget. Well, I might suggest, and we can discuss this, what that means and is, if that is healthy or reasonable, right? Is that... Uh, what do you guys think when you see the question mark? What answer do you come up with kind of instinctively? <clears throat> is, it, is it possible to forgive and forget? Forgive but don't forget. Okay. Any other thoughts? Anyone want to argue to the contrary? The idea of forgetting with forgiveness? It's kind of a controversial thing. And we'll talk about why it, sometimes it's hard. Um, the word forget, I think, is more of, uh, it's, it's a word we use, but I don't think anyone means it. I think it's symbolic of something that might be meaningful to us, this kind of moving forward, not being stuck. Um, but I don't know about truly forgetting. We might create some distance, we might, you know, um, have some greater peace, <clears throat> but I don't know. And I might even suggest that forgetting may not be healthy um, because it might open the door for us to be um, treated poorly again. <clears throat> okay, I got a bunch of quotes in here because uh, there, there's a lot of good material from, uh, if you Google forgiveness, if you read books, there are there's so many good, powerful quotes on this topic because it is a human, condition that's very uh, impactful in our lives. So Viktor Frankl here, <clears throat> uh, he uh, wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. If you haven't read it, I'd recommend it. Uh, he's a psychiatrist that, uh, before he was a psychiatrist, he was, in his youth, he was uh, yeah, a, a, a Jew in a concentration camp. Uh, and he shares some of the experiences that way. Definitely shaped his, his work in mental health field. Um, anyway, this quote, it's kind of a, a thinker here for a second. Man can preserve a vestige of spiritual freedom, of independence of mind, even in such terrible conditions of psychic and physical stress. What do you think he's saying? Take in mind, he's been in a concentration camp. He spent some time in some pretty poor conditions. What do you think he's saying here? It's not the act, but how we react okay. causes us our stress. It's possible to gain some space, to have some peace, even in the most terrible 
of having gone through terrible circumstances. Spiritual independence of mind from the most mental or physical stressors. Think about that a little bit. It's possible. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it, but it is possible. So what is this? If we were to, if you guys were to tell me, you know, from your personal experiences, um, from reading books, whatever, how would you kind of describe or define forgiveness? What is it exactly? Acceptance. Acceptance. Okay. Good. What else? Forget. Okay. Very good. What else would you say forgiveness is? Letting go of the anger. Letting go of the anger. Mm -hmm. You bet. Can it also be an interaction? Sometimes something that happens between people. Yeah. Yeah. But not necessarily required. Sometimes it makes it easier if there's participation. Yeah. Here's a couple of definitions here. The feeling of peace that emerges as you take your hurt less personally, take responsibility for how you feel, and become a hero instead of a victim in the story you tell. What do you think about that? Any thoughts or impressions about forgiveness from Dr. Luskin's quote there? He wrote a book called Forgive for Good, and uh, he talks very adamantly about that forgiveness is something that happens here. And you hear in his quote that it's possible and it is it's quite a good experience to switch from a victim to a hero in my story. That's kind of empowering, isn't it? Dr. Schwartz says that an active process in which you make a conscious decision to let go of negative feelings, whether the person deserves it or not. I like that last phrase. A conscious decision to let go of negative feelings. Not let go of acts, right? But let go of negative feelings whether the other person deserves it or not. Those are those good ones? Anything you would add now or subtract from our working definition of forgiveness? You're not forgiving him for him or the person that offended you. You're giving him for yourself. Very much so. And oftentimes, the opposite is true, that we're holding on to our anger in an attempt hurt him. to hurt the other person or to help make them feel bad or gain some sort of justice but often doesn't work that way. Good, very good. All right, here's some things that forgiveness is not. We don't have to condone unkind, inconsiderate or selfish behavior to forgive. It's still wrong, it's still not good. It's not necessarily forgetting about that something painful happened. My memories are still there, I don't have to have electroshock therapy to erase those memories or overload with alcohol or pain meds and people do those kind of things, right? They try and get away. Doesn't mean that we give up any claims to justice or compensation. Those things are a restitution. Those are separate things. They can be, right? Emotional, legal. It doesn't have to be this kind of religious, otherworldly experience. It might be a little more practical than that. It can be this, and a lot of people find a lot of peace and, and um, forgiveness in their religious beliefs and their faith. It helps. Yeah. It doesn't always require reconciliation with the other person. And you don't have to give up having feelings. Some people believe that forgiveness is, they go from this being in pain to trying not to feel at all. Because that seems like the only way, right? There's some middle ground there. We can have feelings and forgive. 
What do you think? Anything you would add or subtract from that list? Is there? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Another quote from a poet, an English poet. Good nature and good sense must ever join. Error is human to forgive divine. You heard that before? At least the last, last half? What do you think about that quote? What, uh, what is that? What kind of insights does that give us into this kind of juxtaposition between anger, resentment, and forgiveness? Being hurt and being a, of a hero instead of a victim. To err is human. So feeling that pain to not forgive, for it to be tough to forgive, is human. It happens to all of us. It doesn't make me a bad person. It doesn't make me something. It is what it is. It also says to forgive divine, meaning that it is more than what is natural for ourselves. Think about that a little bit. It takes a little bit of work. It doesn't always happen naturally. Any other thoughts on that quote? Well, let's talk about the benefits then of forgiveness. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but there are, of course, mental and emotional benefits. There are also physical benefits to forgiveness. So these, uh, these um, statements are pulled from um, resource research articles. Um, and uh, some of them are kind of interesting. You'll, you can hear the kind of the research in the statement, but people who are more forgiving have fewer health problems. They have less stress, anxiety, depression, including the physical symptoms associated with those. People who blame other people for their troubles have higher incidences of illness, cardiovascular and even cancer. If you imagine not forgiving someone, there are negative changes in your blood pressure. So the blood pressure goes up, um, you get more tense, and your, your immune response is, is slowed. I don't know the science behind immune response. Um, that's, that's above my pay grade. But. On the other side, if you do kind of imagine forgiving someone, those people reported improvement immediately in their heart rate blood pressure, muscle tension, and uh, nervous systems. I don't know, what do you think? Is that, is that surprising to you? Does that make sense? How does it work? It makes sense, because if you're not forgiving, it's consuming you. Yeah, yeah. And what does the consuming do? Crippled you. Yeah. And sometimes we think, well, that's just, a, that's just a, something that's happening here or here, right? But it's a physical expenditure of of energy. Yeah. So you think about that a little bit. When I'm angry, what is my physical body like? Yeah. This is like, ah, right? My body doesn't like long term expenditures of that type of energy. Yeah. Can even cause or increase incidences of cancer. Decrease in immune response, what's that all about? Well, I think it fits. If you look at um, uh, places like the CDC and the World Health Organization, they have lots of statistics on stress. And they say that you know, stress itself, and I'm just kind of guessing, because I'm not a medical doctor, that it, well, 80% of all primary care doctor visits can be related to stress, for one. Um, but maybe this kind of expenditure of energy somehow takes away from other places that it's needed, right? If I have to put all of this into, or this kind of long-term high blood pressure, high heart rate, right? I might be more susceptible uh, to wearing out, having some problems there. So there's a benefit to this forgiveness, not just the typical like, well, it'll improve my relationships and I'll feel better. There's physical benefits to forgiveness. Any others that you would add to this? 
things that you've noticed in life that is a benefit from forgiveness? I didn't put it on here. Well, it fits under the symptoms associated sleep better. A lot of people who uh, struggle with kind of forgiving are kind of spinning information. There's a lot of anxiety associated with what's going to happen next and when am I going to see this person? How am I going to deal with that? And that activation often interferes with sleep. Yeah. Another reason maybe why we're more susceptible to illness, we're not sleeping well, our body's not recovering, it's not using those kind of restart functions that are important. What gets in the way? Any thoughts on what gets in the way of people being able to forgive? Being stubborn. Yes, being stubborn. Why, why are we stubborn with forgiveness? Makes you look like less of a person. It does feel like that, huh? Seems like I'm giving something up. Yeah. Hmm. What else might be a barrier? Things that get in the way of people forgiving. Anger. Yeah, anger itself, right? Just keeps spinning back, right? Or maybe I'm, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm around that person and they keep, they keep doing it. Or just being around them or in those same situations brings up the memories, right? So that's the proximity to the offending party there. Or, and the ongoing transgression of the offending party. If it keeps happening, of course, I'm not going to be able to move away from it. Yeah. Having a desire for revenge, why do you think that gets in the way of forgiveness? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? Make it, them feel what you are feeling. Yeah, which feels good, maybe kind of short term. But it really is kind of the opposite path of forgiveness, right? We're kind of building momentum with that anger it rather than. Work. Yeah. I would recommend that most of the time that it is less than satisfactory. Yeah. You're hurting yourself more and more. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This one is a big one for, for a lot of people that have trouble, trouble with forgiving, is it's rumination on the hurtful act. What does that word rumination mean? Yeah. Some people in my field don't like this word um, because it, it actually comes, it's, it's a descriptor that's often used with um, cows and they're chewing of their, what is it called, the cud or whatever, right? They're constantly chewing. So this word seems kind of demeaning on some level, but it's, Maybe not. Maybe there's some truth to that. Some, maybe it kind of exposes some of the um, falseness of what spinning that information seems to do for me. But if, if I can't get it out of my head, if I keep repeating it, I'm going to be stuck. And not just because the information's um, just being repeated, but my brain doesn't care about time. And so whatever's inside my head, my brain thinks is happening right now often. And so I have a physiological response. So I'm not just thinking often about the past hurt. I'm reliving it. And so it can't, right? My fight or flight system's like, well, this is dangerous. OK, well, we got to keep this dangerous to keep ourselves safe. And so sometimes it's hard to let go of because it feels like I'm going to be unsafe or somehow I'm going to be giving up some sort of power. Right? That's where the feelings of powerless come from. Unfortunately, us human beings don't like the feeling of acceptance because it feels like the absence of something. It feels like I, I don't have control. But things like anger and guilt, they give me a great sense of control. right? Because if I just... If they just change, if I can just get them to do what they need to do to change, like, I'll be okay. If I just do everything right, nothing bad's ever going to happen to me. Like, that feels powerful, right? But it's a bit false. I can't control all of that stuff. I think it's also letting go of the power they have on you. Also. Especially. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. 
Um, exactly that. It feels like I have power by keeping the anger, but really it's the opposite. They maintain this power, right? Because they are still controlling how I feel today, and they might be off somewhere else, right? Not even be around me, but they still are in charge of my emotional experience today. Yeah. So you can see how it can kind of trick us. Our emotions can kind of trick us into these kind of short-term, it feels like it's going to make a difference in, the sh in its short-term focus, but in the long run, it does the opposite. Okay. Other thoughts on barriers to forgiveness, things that get in the way? Okay. I think we had another quote. Oh, I like this quote. Another poet. Um, I like the the imagery in this one. Of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you are given and the pain given back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. That's fairly philosophical, but that's that's interesting, isn't it? Like the imagery, like at the beginning, it feels like empowering and anger is fun, right? Like there's energy to it, but as you get invested in that, you end up in a wasted place. Yeah. I like that one. All right. So let's talk about some ways to forgive other people, some tips or hints or what are some success stories you've had on being able to forgive other people. And in this particular place, I want to be talking about the interaction where the other person actually participates, OK? Um, so this is that kind of, there's acknowledgment, there's reconciliation, all that stuff. What are some, what are some important pieces to pay attention to when engaging in a formal or interactional forgiveness process, do you think? Listening to what they have to say. OK. Not get on the defensive. Yeah, try and stay kind of open a little bit, right? It also means maybe that it's OK for there to be some time for me to kind of get myself prepared for that. Just because the other person wants to apologize doesn't mean I have to be ready to forgive. Good. Other thoughts? What is important to pay attention to in a good forgiveness interaction? Body language. OK. There's some people that say, I'm sorry, but they really don't mean it. Mm -hmm. You can just see it. Yeah. Yeah. It's OK to hold people accountable for what they've done. Doesn't necessarily mean we have to be angry to do that. So it feels like sometimes, but it's okay to hold people accountable. I used to work at a group home for adolescent sex offenders. And part of their treatment was uh, forgiveness and reconciliation to those they offended. And unfortunately, as you might know, uh, most of these offenses take place in the home. And so it's usually to a sibling or a cousin or something like that. And so we schedule these um, apology sessions where we're going to put the offender and the, and the victim in the same room. And everyone's got their therapist. And we spent months preparing apology letters, going through with a fine tooth comb, right? Because we want them to take responsibility for themselves to not justify or diminish the impact of their offense and to be sincere. Some people never get to that phase because they can't, because of some of their personalities don't allow them to get there. And then you put them all together, and, and we send those apology letters to the, 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 um, the other client's therapist. And the, that therapist will then review those apology letters and make 
suggestions and also share the apology letter with their client so that there's, there's, there's not a surprise, right? That's pretty intense, isn't it? It's pretty intense. There can be some good experiences though, but it's okay for there to be the right conditions. It's okay for it to be um, a difficult process because it's meaningful for me as maybe the offended party and also for the person who has done the offense. Because how better to learn some empathy or to change their behavior than to have to suffer a little bit as a result of their concept, their actions. So it's okay, right? Let's see. Boundaries are important. Um, it's something to think about. That if I, if I accept someone's apology, this happens all, I, I see this every day in, in practice. Um, some couple or one part of a couple comes in and, and they're talking about you know, affairs and, and uh, cheating and things like that. And, and they keep talking about it. Well, it keeps happening, it keeps happening, it keeps happening, right? <clears throat> and, we, and the person is just in perpetual pain because one, over time, they just believe that there's no trust and there's, it's just perpetual pain, right? So how can they really forgive their partner because it's still happening? And so there needs to be some boundaries and some physical space to create, maybe physical space, maybe just emotional space, but some predictability to the relationship if we are going to do any kind of reconciliation, if we are going to have healthy relationship. Because if, if my fight or flight system thinks, oh, you're doing it again, well, it doesn't matter if you're doing it again or not. That's real for me, so the offense has, been, has happened. And so boundaries are an important part of forgiveness. I don't think a lot of people spend much time with that. Um, people often say, well, I'm sorry, right? Um, but there's not usually a conversation that happens next. So what does that mean? I had this conversation with my son. And I have to have a lot of these conversations with my son. He's seven, very physical kid, right? His way of saying hi is to walk up and slug you in the gut. Like <laughs> one of those, you know what I mean? Like he's just having a blast. He doesn't know what he's doing. But this idea of, you know, it runs into he whacks his sister and she's in tears, right? Not because of physical pain usually, but because, because she's upset that he's in his space and all these things. So we have the timeout. And we have the, the forgiveness, you know, tell your sister you're sorry. And then I, I try to have with them this conversation, what does this mean? What are you really telling your sister when you say you're sorry? And he's like, that I won't hit her again? Yes, don't hit her again, right? That one hasn't sunk in yet, but, <laughs> but that is an important part of the forgiveness process, right? Is that boundary is explicitly spelled out. This is not okay, don't do it again. Here's the new bounds of our relationship if we're going to continue. In those apology letters I talk about uh, with these sex offenders, there is lengthy descriptions of how am I going to keep you safe in the future? And sometimes that just means you're never going to see me. I'm not going to family parties. I'm not going to, uh, there's going to be no surprises, right? Very detailed descriptive boundaries. That's an important piece of forgiveness. Now, whether the other person follows those boundaries or not, that's a whole different story. But in setting the boundary, that could be a very meaningful part of the forgiveness process. Maybe I can let go of some of this kind of angst that I'm holding on to to try and protect myself, because now maybe I have a little bit of trust back in terms of, if nothing else, um, how to interact in the future. So I don't need the anger to keep myself, myself safe. What do you think? Any thoughts or questions this way so far? So I have this continuum across the bottom here. What kind of a forgiver are you? Are you on the side of the spectrum where you just freely share your forgiveness with everybody, but you don't really mean it? You don't really forgive? It's cheap. Or are you on the other side of the spectrum where you just absolutely refuse to forgive? See if you can put yourself on that 
continuum here. I might suggest that somewhere in the middle is better. <laughs> that even though you might be kind of freely forgiving people, and that might be good for them, are you really letting go of the pain? I don't know. It's something to consider. And if you're, if you're not, maybe we need to do some things differently. Either in, like I said, set some different boundaries, hold, maybe be kind of courageous in standing up for myself a little bit and, and allowing there to be some consequence and some time between uh, the offense and, and uh, the forgiveness. But I don't have to refuse to forgive either. That one's equally dangerous. Both of them, I would suggest, kind of create this building kind of energy and resentment that, as we've already established, is dangerous to my physical health as well as my mental and emotional health. I don't know if you ever thought of it that way before. It's not just forgive or not forgive. Like maybe there is some. Yeah. Okay. So in this kind of interaction with other people, this forgiveness interaction with other people, what's one or two things that maybe you might do a little bit different in the future? For your own sake or for just in kind of having a better process in forgiving other people face to face? Boundaries. Yeah? The boundaries one? Not let somebody cross a boundary. Yep. That way you, it doesn't build up to such yeah. an extent. Yeah. So this fits into that category of forgive and forget. So we don't have to forget. And it's important that we don't because it's okay to protect myself from that happening again. But that doesn't mean that I have to hold on to the anger and the pain associated with it, right? Yeah, good. Other thoughts, things you might do a little bit different in this interaction with other people? Okay, well think about that, it's okay for it to be a process. It's okay for it to be a formal thing. You don't have to just let people kind of trounce all over you and not stand up. Right? Another way I think people are cheap forgivers is they might, um, they just take this passive approach, right? And they feel better when they go and talk to their friend about what happened over here, but they never tell this friend that that hurt them. So they feel better because they kind of vented it, right? But there was never, this friend might do it again. They don't necessarily know. Or if they do know, they don't, there's no attempt at setting a boundary. So maybe I'm going to get hurt again. So cheap forgiveness can be a little too permissive that way. All right, another quote. This is kind of a heavy stuff, isn't it? Woo! <sighs> yes, it is heavy. This is another 17th century noble, Lord Herbert. He that cannot forgive others breaks the bridge over which he must pass himself. For every man has need to be forgiven. It's interesting. If I'm refusing to forgive, how can I expect forgiveness myself? We're, we're, we're good at noticing hypocrites, aren't we? We're in danger of that ourselves all the time. <laughs> yeah. All right, here's the, the magic stuff. So this is some ideas about forgiving without other people when they don't want to participate or can't participate. Um, so that's either they're unrepentant, they're not willing to take responsibility, or maybe something else has happened. Maybe there's been a death. Maybe there's been some kind of distance or um, estrangement that doesn't allow for communication. We need to have some, some way to do that. So what do you think? What are some, some suggestions, tips you would give a friend about forgiving other people, even if they're not involved? How do you let go? Because that's kind of the, what we're talking about a little bit here, right? We're, we're letting go or choosing to forgive, 
how do you how do you navigate that? I think it comes to a point where it's overwhelming that you just need to let it go. Yeah. Sometimes it does. It reaches some critical mass and you finally realize this isn't worth it. Right? I'm not accomplishing anything, I'm not making any progress. This person is not changing, whatever. And you finally there's some sort of cathartic moment or enough time has passed that you can just kind of like set it down. Yeah. Okay. Other thoughts? Advice you would give? So like I said, it, forgiveness can be a choice. And it might, I might suggest even, um, at the bottom here we'll talk about this too, but maybe it's a regular choice. <laughs> right? Something that's happening hourly or daily. And um, it's a skill that can be learned. And what I mean by this is, like I mentioned before, the brain doesn't care about time. So whatever's in my head is happening right now. So if nothing else, then forgiveness is this kind of switching or being able to shift something that seems like it's happening right now into a memory. For it not to be present, but to be past. Okay? And this might also, I suggest, the difference between shifting from what part of your brain you're functioning from. In this primitive fight or flight part of my brain, what am I doing? I'm hyperventilating. I have adrenaline, right? I am, but it's not a rational place, and no problem solving happens in that, in that part of my brain. I might spin the anger over and over again because it feels like I'm going to get there, but I don't come up with solutions, right? So a choice might mean a few deep breaths, right? Um, and maybe kind of reminding or talking myself through that this is not happening today. So I might choose to forgive for the next hour, meaning I'm going to put it aside. I'm going to let this be past for the next hour. Right? And maybe I have a, a more peaceful, relaxed moment, if nothing else, because maybe then my physical body can relax instead of be tense. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what are some things that might help us switch from this primitive brain to this executive brain, which the human thinking part of our brain, this is where language is, all those things. What are some tips you might give just to switch? Not to, not to forgive necessarily or process any of that information, but just to try and switch from one part of my brain to the other. Okay, yes, count to 10. I, had a, I worked at the Katie Hospital in their uh, behavioral health unit, and I, there was a therapist that every once in a while, when a, when a client was having a, a panic attack or something like that, he would sit down with them and do math problems with them. It's hard to do math from this part of your brain, right? But this part. And the problems don't change necessarily. But my physiological response changes, and I open this part of my brain back up to a problem-solving mode. And I might come up with some ideas, right? Yeah. That my primitive brain says, anger, resentment, revenge, right? This human part of my brain is going to be more compassionate and forgiving. So sometimes I just have to get there. So you might do something that engages that part of your brain a little bit. I would suggest breathing is the, is the key between these two parts of my brain. In this primitive place, I'm hyperventilating or holding my breath, and that's a signal that fight or flight. But if I can slow down my heart rate, maybe relax my physical body a little bit, um, it can happen very quickly. There's that switch. To that part of my brain. Okay. So what does this mean, taking responsibility for your emotions? We kind of mentioned this before. So you're that, giving them control. Yes. Yep. So we're basically saying, you're in charge of my anger, 
So you fix it. Well, how much control do I have over that person changing? None. But if I switch that around, this is my anger. What can I do to calm down? Right? This is my sadness. Well, what can I do to cheer up? It would be nice if that happened, right? But I don't have control over that. So it may not be, of course, this glorious solve all my world's problems, but I can feel better by taking response, looking inside and taking some control. Maybe it is just like I said, let's set it over here. Let's put it aside for today. And that, I can do that. I might have to do that a lot at first, especially because sometimes it becomes habitual to spin that information uh, or we're triggered by memories and people and all around us. So it might take some work to kind of retrain my brain to kind of leave that over there. Um, but it's possible. I have some power over my emotional state. And I really like when, when people really kind of get that connection. I'm angry. He's making me angry. I'm angry, right? There's some empowerment in that all of a sudden. Like, oh, I'm angry. <laughs> do I want to be angry? Well, what can I do about it? As opposed to the other one that just makes me kind of amplify and intensify it to try and get rid of it. Most of the time, they don't know or care. Exactly. <laughs> Usually not. Usually not. Yep. I like this. This this is a uh, some some topics from Dr. Luskin's book, Forgive for Good. But he says he said, how much space are you renting in your head to this person, right? And is it the penthouse suite or is it the closet in the back? Like this idea of let's, why are we letting this person have so much power over our daily life? It's not happening right now, but they're still kind of in charge. They're in the penthouse, right? So how do I move it from the penthouse suite to the closet in the back? Well, be aware of your story. How are you telling yourself this story? He calls it a grievance story. How do I tell other people this story? And is there a way maybe to shift that a little bit that has a little more empathy and compassion? Not necessarily for the offender, but for me. Or maybe I can switch it to a hero story as opposed to a victim story. Perseverance and overcoming difficult situations. Great support on my team. I've learned great lessons. That's a whole different emotional experience, right? So sometimes, what is this story I'm telling myself, I'm telling other people, and can, maybe I can rewrite that story a little bit. Give me some power to move out of, get it out of the penthouse suite. I like this metaphor, changing the channel. We all watch TV. Right, how easy is it to change the channel on your TV? We're so lazy, we don't even have to pick up a remote anymore, right? When I was a little kid, I was the remote. I had to go, right? Go change the channel, right? And now I don't have to get Alexa. Do they have Alexa in the basement? Oh, that's too bad. I could cause some problems. Turn off the lights, right? But we can do a similar thing kind of mentally and emotionally. You know, what channel am I on? Well, I'm in the anger channel. OK, what channel do we want to be in? What channel would be a little more better for me emotionally? Some suggestions might be the gratitude channel, the beauty channel. And, and not like modeling kind of things, but just kind of looking for the beauty in the world. Things that are beautiful, right? Forgiveness channel. Come, come back to this idea of choosing. Uh, and the love channel. So why do you think those four are, why do you think those four have the power to shift from a negative to a positive kind of emotional experience. For one, whatever's in our head is what my body believes is happening. So if I'm putting information in my head that says, you know, I'm grateful for my life. There are good things happening. I have great people around me. Well, how do I feel? It doesn't necessarily take away from what happened, right? 
And the other piece is the, this, it is just that those are positive things. You think about it in terms of energy, right? Positive and negative energy. Oftentimes I have people come to my office and we're working on anger management. And some of the typical, especially for men, the typical kind of anger management skills are you know, to, to put their aggression somewhere else. Punching pillows, punching bags, some sort of physical aggression, right? And for some that works, it's kind of a transference, right? But for others, it, it kind of perpetuates it. And I would suggest because they're still using kind of this negative energy, right? So I try and suggest, well, let's do things that are creative. Because let's take that kind of negative energy and put it into a positive energy. And it might still be exercise in some form, but maybe it's, right? Or maybe it's gardening or <laughs> doing a puzzle. Who knows, right? But the creation side has this kind of intrinsic positivity to it that's powerful. So what channel am I in? And can I change the channel? And you might kind of metaphorically or symb symbolically kind of <laughs> imagine changing the channel, right? And maybe you're surfing channels. Maybe you keep coming back to it. But that's OK. Like, just keep, just keep practicing. Find those channels that, are, that work better for it. Because ultimately, what we, we need in forgiveness is space, right? Because forgiveness, in a lot of ways, it is a choice. But for um, kind of long-term peace, we need um, a predictability over time. And over time, as we have space from it, right? If I, if I keep replaying it, my body keeps thinking, we're having it's happening again, it's happening again, it's happening again, I never separate from it. But if I can gain some space, have some boundaries with myself even about this content, then these painful things fade to memory as opposed to present time. It des we desensitize, we soften over time. And we can speed that up by how much, where's, how much space are we renting in our head for this. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we come back to this idea of compartments and boundaries. So maybe we even need to be a little structured with ourselves. Maybe we need to schedule our angry time. Three o'clock, and let's limit it to half an hour. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to scribble on paper. I'm going to yell. I'm going to scream. I'm going to, right? But once that half an hour is over, I throw it away until tomorrow. And then when it shows up in my head an hour later, I can say, nope, not until tomorrow. So I'm not ignoring it, but I can have some boundaries. I don't have to spend all my time with it. Right? And then again, this kind of compartment is, you know, I can choose to forgive today. I can let go of this anger just for a short time, maybe. And maybe I can string a few of those together. It doesn't have to be so global. Right? I have to forgive, and it can never come back. Yeah. But we're looking for peace. We're looking for a little bit of distance. Thoughts, questions, things you would add or subtract from this idea of how do I forgive other people when they're not there or not willing to participate? Have you ever thought of it this way, some of these ideas? Sometimes you just have to breathe. You just have to, what part of my brain am I in? <laughs> right? Yeah, and this part of my brain says, you know what, it's, it's OK. It's not happening right now. I got some time. We'll take care of this tomorrow when I'm ready. I've got supportive people on my team. I can ask for help. Fight or flight says, danger. Get away. Yeah. All right. Oh, forgot about this part. So part of what happens in relationships and especially when there's been pain, is we start creating these rules in the relationship. And when they, be, when they are unenforceable rules, it's this idea of how much we're giving them too much space, right? So basically, if we'll take one of these off here. Life should be fair is a common unenforceable rule. What makes it unenforceable? Life's not fair. I can't control people around me. And so what happens? 
in this anger, fight or flight place, I try real hard to enforce that rule. And what happens? Well, I met with resistance and disappointment, frustration because people are going to lie to me. So this idea then is, one, recognize these unenforceable rules. And let's see if we can shift them from a life should be fair to I wish life was fair. I hope life to be fair in the future. What does that do? Think about that. Let's pick one. Let's pick, let's pick, my life has to be easy, right? No, let's, not, let's, do, a, let's do a relationship one. Um, uh, my partner has to be faithful. Think about it from that place. My, my has to be faithful, right? My partner has to be. I'm, I'm in charge. I have to make sure that they're faithful. What do I feel? My blood pressure goes up. I feel tense, a little anxious, right? Okay, let's breathe and let's switch that to hope or wish. I wish my partner to be faithful. I hope that they are faithful. There's acceptance in that, right? It's still true that that would be nice, that that is an important part of our relationship, but I'm acknowledging what I can and cannot enforce, right? That makes sense? And maybe you notice some of those in, I do this a lot with my kids just naturally, right? Because most of my parenting is done from fight or flight. <laughs> my kids are supposed to be respectful to me. <laughs> okay, well, where does that get me, right? I would, I would hope that they would be respectful. I wish for them to be respectful. I need to say that more often before How I does that engage. work in the ones that are in the past? Okay. Yeah. Comforting. Well, <laughs> yes, and I think it often denotes kind of some determination for the future because when we get stuck in the past, especially if we start spinning the past, what we're really trying to do is gain some control over it, right? It feels like if I just think about it enough or if I'm angry enough that somehow I can get away from that or more likely what I'm saying to myself is if I do everything right, if I can get people to behave, nothing bad will ever happen to me, right? And so there's some acceptance, hopefully, that happens that says, it did happen. I wish it didn't, but it did. What's next, right? How do I shift it from something that was or something that feels real now to something that is past and I have space with? That was a real hard one for people because you're right. We can't change the past. Yeah. And then, of course, we want to have more realistic boundaries around these people. I worked with a woman who um, her mom treated her poorly. But she still wanted to be part of her mom's life. She has, you know, we all have this kind of blood loyalty, right? Um, and so she found herself, every time she interacted with her mom, her anxiety would go up. She'd get super angry because her mom kept treating her poorly. She had this expectation that somehow, you know, if, if she just did the right things or just gave it the right, the right time, that her mom was going to treat her right. And of course, she's just perpetuating anger and disappointment. So she had to accept her mom's not going to treat her well. And so then that means when I go and visit my mom, you know what? I'm going to be prepared to be treated poorly. And then set some boundaries around that. I'm only going to spend an hour. And this is how I'm going to respond to her comments. I'm not going to take it personal. If things get rough, I'm out. Right? She's taken that control back. And she's set some more realistic expectations. It's still sad, right? She still would love her mom to have a better relationship. But at least it's not perpetuating the anger that's happening around that. And the anxiety. Her anxiety went way down because she didn't have to force something that was going to happen. She could be, just be kind of in that sad place instead. Does that make sense? So we need to set some boundaries so that we're not getting caught up in these unenforceable rules over and over again. Okay. 
Ooh, time. Here we go. Doing an injury puts you below your enemy. Revenging one makes you but even with him. Forgiving sets you above. I like some of these analogies like we're talking about here. You know, who's really affected by my anger? And when I, from this part of my brain, right, when I acknowledge that, I realize, hey, I'd rather be above than on the same level or below this person who treated me poorly. Yeah. Forgiving yourself. We have to go through this sort of quickly, but I would suggest that's okay because it's some of the same principles we're talking about already, just apply it to myself. This one's kind of hard. Why do you think it's hard for people to forgive themselves? Yes, yes. How often, um, well, let's say it this way. Do you treat other people the way you treat yourself? If I were to take my inner thoughts, those kind of negative things, would I say those things to other people? She said I would like to. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have a job if I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and when it comes down to it, we don't because we don't see people that way necessarily, right? But we see ourselves much kind of falsely negative than we need to. And I think that prevents us from forgiving. Like I said, sometimes it feels like if I hold on to this, then somehow I'm preventing myself from doing it in the future. Well. Maybe I can have those boundaries and improve my behavior without being so mean to myself along the way. So there's kind of four categories of, of, of dip, people having trouble forgiving themselves. So failing at, a, at an important life task, not taking action when it was thought necessary. Uh, maybe we just hurt somebody. We're upset about that. Or self-destructive acts. You know, These are things like alcohol and drugs and some of these things we do to ourselves that Kind of four categories of things we hold against ourselves. So, well, what do we have control over that we've, just, we've learned today? Well, if I want to feel better, well, I'm gonna change my behavior. I'm gonna do something different, right? I like this statement here. Learn to do good rather than feel bad. So I might feel bad for a while, but if I'm purposely doing good, and maybe I, I balance the ledger a little bit and come out the other side eventually. I gain some confidence and some evidence to support that, that I have worth and can forgive. Make amends. Do kind and loving things for other people. This can help me forgive myself, right? I'm actively doing my part. Therefore, maybe I can breathe a little better. Self-compassion. So, and telling a, a positive intention story. So this kind of comes back to that grievance story idea. What kind of story am I telling about myself and is it a fair story to tell? And can I shift that a little bit? And maybe it is even in, um, you know, what would I say to a friend about what's going on for me? And see if I can kind of translate back that to myself. Okay. Again, unenforceable rules. What am I, what kind of, Unrealistic expectations do I have for myself that I might be able to shift or adjust? Um, um, choose for today, change the channel, um, and fight fair. Look for the things that are good, that I am doing well, that I can appreciate in my life. Because um, that helps soften things, right? Because it's not all negative, but sometimes it feels that way because it's in my head. And if I look for others, I might find this more positive place. Loosens things up and then hopefully over time I can kind of let go of some of that pain and anger that I hold for myself. Other tips for forgiving yourself? You might think about that a little bit. It's, it's pretty, it it's, makes more sense to forgive other people, but I don't know if we've spent much time. Are there things inside of you that you haven't forgiven yourself for? And maybe it's worth investigating. Maybe it's worth seeing if we can shift that or loosen that up. 
and it might improve how I sleep. It might improve my relationships with other people. Okay. Last quote. A wise man will make haste to forgive because he knows the true value of time and will not suffer it to pass away in unnecessary pain. This kind of comes back to this point, right? That my anger is unnecessary pain. It's not changing anything. It's not fixing anything. But it definitely is affecting um, myself. Right? All these English poets philosophical about forgiveness. Right? Here's a couple books that are good. I would also suggest, um, uh, oh, I just lost it. Oh, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, it doesn't, he's not talking about forgiveness in general, but he's talking about this, this space that can be created between what happens to us and how we feel about it. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Double points for everybody. Yay.